Ignatius Press and the Augustine Institute present The Formed Book Club. Catholic book lovers unpacking good books chapter by chapter. If you like us, please help us by subscribing and by reviewing us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you might listen. And don't forget to sign up for weekly updates and study questions at formedbookclub.ignatius.com. Welcome to the Form Book Club. We continue to discuss Paradox and Mystery by Henri Lubac and the Church, Paradox and Mystery. Uh, we have been, I won't say plodding along, because we've been trippingly, uh, in- interestingly moving along and discussing this book, but, Val- but Lubac raises questions and makes statements which are which elicit reflection and even sometimes controversy, friendly controversy. I think the word is ponderously. We've been progressing ponderously because we've been stopping to ponder every sentence. Oh, very good. All right, well, we're on page 68, and we're getting to another very important topic here. Uh, About the middle of the page, he says... uh, Similarly, though none of the chapters is specifically devoted to the maternity of the church, the title of mother is several times attributed to her. we we'll turn this into the chapter 7. All the same, we should remark here that this title was used with more consistency by the fathers and evoked more precise commentary. So this is a, a subtle criticism, uh, but in a positive way, uh, because... He who, the Lubach, who really knew the whole tradition of the church, especially the high Middle Ages and prior to that, knew that the, the principal images of the church in the Middle Ages were mother and virgin. Those are the two. Uh, institution wasn't even used. Sacrament wasn't used. Uh, people of God was used. And, and other scriptural exam, example or images like house of God, vineyard of the Lord, and so on. But uh, he, what we'll see as he uh, proceeds here that the council did not neglect that idea of Mary and the church as a mother. In fact, the last chapter was on, on Mary as mother of the church. Uh, but again, background, I mentioned this book before called The Motherhood of the Church. Uh, we we gave it that title uh, because of its first part, but it's actually two separate, you know, texts here. I mentioned the second one already about the particular church, the universal church. That has to do with bishops' conferences and so on. It's more institutional. But the first part is mother of the church. And and uh, this is also by Delubach. Yeah, excuse me. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> by by Delubach. And... Uh, this was something which he wasn't alone in bringing back into prominence, but he certainly was a major factor in understanding and bringing back the traditional understanding that Trish is feminine. Because whether I think our society is obsessed by sex and gender more even than other societies have been. And at that very time, we're obsessed by it. We've lost the sense uh, until the council, now it's becoming much more prominent, until the council of the church as feminine, the church as mother, the church as bride and virgin. Uh, and so we're going to see more references to that as we go on. Uh, By the way, this is, this is a shout out to another book we've just published, Sigrid Unset, Reader of Hearts by Father Aidan Nichols. I'm currently reading that because I'm going to be doing some publicity for uh-huh. that book. And I just read last night Sigrid Unset saying that those titles, virgin, mother, bride, you know, applied to the church and applied to the Christian are the greatest thing that ever happened to women in human history. Really? I'd like to see that. I had no idea that uh, Father Nichols had written a book on Sigrid Unset. That's something I need to check out. It's really good. Now, page 70, and interrupt me if you have something prior to this, but about 10 lines down, when it is speaking of holiness, though the fact that the church is a sanctifying mother is not forgotten, 
The exposition of the universal vocation of sanctity receives the fullest treatment. In short, it is a question less of the mother than of the children, of the inhabitants rather than of the house, of the assembly in Christ, congregatio, rather than the voice that summons, convocatio. So here he's explaining why the church as sanctifying mother is somewhat overshadowed by the church as the children of the mother who are sanctified. So this is all in the section on the people of God. Anything more on the people of God? Vivian, you got underlying things? You want to comment on things? Or? Well, the eschatological perspective, which is the next section, yes. is also, there is something, there are some important things here. All right. Um, you know, this whole question of, in fact, look at this. I, 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 wow. Toward the end of this section, you know, this whole question, is the kingdom here? Is it not yet here? Uh, and, and, um, and is it within history? Is history unfolding? You know, all these questions that have been brought to bear in, 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 in the 19th and 20th centuries about human progress and all these things that started to creep into Christianity. And so I found this section really fruitful reading. And, uh, for me, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to solve these paradoxes or riddles or something by coming up with images or something. The thing that about it here and not here and, well, look at Jesus' analogy of this mustard seed. You put it in the ground and sooner or later that thing is going to grow and grow and grow and grow and all the, all the birds of the air are going to find a home in this plant that started with this tiny seed. Well, that tiny seed, folks, is already doing what it's supposed to be doing. Whether we see it or whether we uh, participate, oh, yeah. you know, it's already here. It's already been planted. It's already doing what it's doing. Well, again, in my advanced age, you prompted me to mention two experiences I had. Uh, one, of planting mustard seeds, because in our vineyard, uh, one year we wanted to have uh, some growth between the rows, and so I planted mustard well, mustard seeds are so small that you, you can't use a spreader for them. You've got to mix them with sand oh. uh, because they're, they're too fine for a spreader. So they really are. Jesus knew that, that they were the smallest of seeds. All right. And then we didn't do that more than once because what happened was they grew up so tall, it was hard for us to get between the vines. Oh. You know? Uh, so that's one thing. The mustard seeds really are small. Secondly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 35, verses around, I think it, chapter 15, verses 35 and so, uh, Paul says, you ask what the risen body will be like. That's a stupid question, <laughs> Paul responds. And then he gives the analogy of the seed. You know, you put a seed in the ground, you don't know what it's going to be. And this goes what you said, Vivian. It's not just that the seed is small and gets big, but... If we didn't know what seeds did and which seeds did what, you could never look at a seed and say, oh, this is, this is a rose, that's a squash. No, 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 you couldn't tell from the seed. Mm -hmm. It's completely, disc not, it appears completely discontinuous with what it's going to become, you know. Uh, and so, like you say, the kingdom of God is hidden, not only hidden because it's in the ground, it's hidden because the seed itself does not reveal what it's going to be. And yeah, it's already here. It's already growing. It's already inviting all the birds to come. You know, it, it's already doing what it's meant to be doing. And so, in a certain sense, these arguments. Um, and, and also, huh, as an analogy of the kingdom, are seeds alive or are they dead? Well, you can have seeds that come from the Tutankhamun's tomb, you know, and plant them and some of them will grow. But when you plant seeds, some germinate and some don't. Well, uh, therefore, some were actually alive and some were not. But the kingdom can be alive and appear to be dead. Right. And, and the church is like that. Right. You know? And so I love this line. You well, know, you, oh, sorry. One, one quick thing. Because this is at the beginning on page 72 at the footnote, 73 there. Cardinal Fring said deplored the absence of the eschatological perspective. Oh. Well, young Ratzinger, that was one of the most important topics that he 
discussed was, was eschatology. And in his book, uh, Introduction Christianity, it plays a major role. And so there again, why did he get into the council? Frings, Ratzinger kind of encouraged him. So that's just a little prelude to what you were going to say. Yeah, ahead, well, please. then, so this, this, uh, so this, I, like I said, I found this last section of this uh, uh, so fruitful. And, and so this question he raises, uh, you know, does the church, where, page where? 78, does the church exist for the world? or the world for the church? There can obviously be only one answer. The church exists for the world. And then he goes back to that question on page 80 saying, um, uh, what is he saying? Um, <laughs> because because man, oh, in the, the will of God is an act which we call the world. I mean, that I, there's so many times I just go, wait a minute. I got to think about this so that his intention is the salvation of man. And this intention we call the church. And that's a quote from Clement Alexandria. So this is one of the early fathers of the church. What, what, what wisdom, you know, let's repeat Beautiful. that in the same way that the will of God is an act which we call the world. <laughs> so God wills the world. Let fiat. Let it be, you know, that fiat looks, let it be, that, that's an act of the will. And it was light. So just as the will of God is an act which you call the world, so his intention, that is, when God creates the world, what's his motive? What's his intention? His intention is the salvation of man, and this intention we call the church. And it embraces the entire world. And so that's why you can say that the church exists for the world. This, this quote, you know, so when he raises this question, he leaves you all these puzzling things going off in your head. You know, he doesn't leave you stranded, the Lubach. He brings it back to where he was leading you all along. Yes, why can we say that the church exists for the world? Because the church is God's, uh, his, God's intention is to save the world, and his intention is the church. I, there's so much there to just reflect on. And give us hope, by the way, okay? We should be people full of hope. That this is God's intention. Yep. And we're part of it when we're part of the church. Yeah, and we, and we prevent it or deflect it or, or adulterate it when we do not do God's will. And if I could just uh, you know, add, add, to, add to that nuance, because I think the nuance is important here, because, you know, he also then quotes uh, the, the, the bottom of page 79, Abbe Monchanam, uh, yes. who deplores, quote, uh, a philosophy that in the end, this is just a few lines down on page 80, def quote, defines the church by reference to the world and no longer the world by reference to the church. So mm -hmm. again, the very thing here is for us to actually define what is meant by the world. If the world is the will of God, right, then absolutely everything that we've just been discussing follows. But if the world is as the world understands itself in a relativistic sense, then obviously we should not be allowing the world to define the church because that's getting things uh, back to front. And so further down here, uh, who is it? Dom Greyer. Uh, the Catholic Church is the beginning of and the reason for all things. Um, so again, there's, 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 there's a nuance here because, you know, I think there's, you know, there's, there's this um, circular thing that one of my favorite lines in Chester that will drive you mad is a quote from a character in The Man Who Was Thursday. It's an anarchist, he's a nihilist, and, and he says, Everybody knows that nothing is worth doing. No, nothing is worth doing. They just think about that, right? It will drive you mad. Um, so, <laughs> but the same thing here, you know, does the church exist for the world or the world for the church? You know, and again, well, what do we mean by the world? What do we mean by the church? Because if we rephrase, does Christ exist for the world or does the world exist for Christ? Or does God exist for the world or does the world exist for God? You know, and, or, you know, if, 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 the, if the world is the will of God, then, you know, maybe you can even say they can't be separated. But the point is that the, the will of God comes first, right? It's the will of God that wills the world. No, uh, no, 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 no. The intention comes first. The intention comes first. 
Well, but, it, but both the intention and the will precede the thing that the consequence of both. Well, but you said the will comes first, and I said no, the intention comes first. Well, the will comes before the world. The intention comes before the will. Wait, say that again. If the world is something created by God, then obviously the God that the will the world comes after the will. The will comes after the intention. In other right. words, the, 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 something's intended and willed, and then something is done. That's right. And therefore, the intention of God is that all things which He is about to create will find their unity together and in Him. That is the Church. And then he creates the world in order that it may become the church. That's the that's the finality of the world is the church. Mm -hmm. Are we saying the same thing or different things? To we're, we're, I think we're all saying the same thing. Okay. We're all saying the same thing. It's just that I, I'm actually reminded now of of that uh, metaphor you gave earlier about if you want to uh, admire the statue of David, you have to walk around it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I I think you know if you just look about state. Taking one or two of these statements, you're only seeing it from this side, and you actually have to also see it from the other side to see it in its entirety, in its yeah. integrity. And that's what I was trying to do is say, yes, but. But not but as in terms of contradiction, but also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vivian, more things? You have a lot underlined on this. No, I'm... I'm, I'm... Well, I want to go back. back. If I... Go well, on, okay. Go yeah, like if page 80, I just, I've just got yes... Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! Exclamation mark! And can I just read the bit that 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 that, that induced such an emphatic margin marginalia? Um, just just to read a few sentences. Can I do that? Because I think this Go is ahead. just spot on. From what what page? This, this is this is the new paragraph on page eighty, the beginning, the first few sentences of. Okay. So. And I'm probably going to pronounce the name wrong, so feel free to correct me, because I don't know what country he comes from. In the second century, Hermas had said the same in the second vision of his pastor. She resembles, he said, an aged woman, quote, because she was created first before anything else. It was for her the world was made, end quote. Yes, made for the church to be assumed into, saved and transfigured by her. For Oregon, the church was the cosmos of the cosmos. For St. Ambrose, the whole orbis terrarum was somehow constrained, contained in her womb. Clement of Alexandria would say, in the same way that the will of God is an act which we call the world, so his intention is the salvation of man, and this intention we call the church. I mean, to me, looking at it from all the different angles prior to it, those few sentences just encapsulate exactly what uh, Dulubak's saying here. Yes, couldn't agree more. I want to briefly mention something in page 76, paragraph at the bottom there. He says, we may well rejoice that in Lumen Gentium, the traditional and patristic thinking has been thus officially revived. It is the consecration of a theological movement of our century a movement stimulated and to some degree necessitated by the general intellectual climate, but a movement also that was itself a revival of what had been at the heart of a Catholic tradition from the beginning and the liturgy had preserved so well. So this is very important because he's, he's yes. making it very clear. Vatican Council II was not a break from tradition. Vatican Council II was a consecration of a threefold movement that took place in the late 19th, early 20th century. Biblical revival, patristic revival, liturgical revival. And so this is, mm -hmm. to this day, we still have this mentality that Vatican II somehow marks a, a watershed between the old, outmoded ways and the new. No, it, it's totally traditional itself. Now, was it hijacked? Was it misinterpreted? Was there a spirit of counsel which did not really, you know, uh, correspond to the council itself? Yes. But the beautiful, beautiful thing about what we're doing now is that we're, we're confirming that the Second Vatican Council is a part of the living tradition of the church, which did not repudiate the past, but actually it's uh, not purified so much, but uh, like a kaleidoscope, 
and you, and you make all these patterns out of it. Well, all the glass in there is, is from, is all broken glass, but you make a new pattern. So the council took all the tradition and put it in a new form. And it's not unusual that movements of the spirit get hijacked. So you think about after the First World War, there was a kind of youth, the ones who were still alive, you know, a youth movement to to reconnect with nature and uh, and sim a simplicity and uh, and you know the whole folk music phenomenon that that started after the First World War and so on. And what did that get hijacked by? National Socialism in Germany. You know that so that that whole let's get back to the purity and simplicity of yeah. life and the folk and all this thing. This thing got hijacked by Nazism and turned into a monstrous form of racism and nationalism uh, to the nth degree. And yet, so much of that 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 was there that was springing up just organically and naturally was a beautiful thing. And in response to this horrific world war and its devastation. Uh, so it's not unusual, right, that there can be things bubbling up because of the Holy Spirit working among us, and it somehow gets hijacked, turned, twisted, a counterfeit of it uh, starts to take get momentum. There's, there's, and we a gotta, wonderful line, there's a wonderful line in one of Tolkien's letters where he talks about um, that uh, ignoramus Adolf Hitler for, for poisoning everything that was beautiful about the North. Right. Should we begin this section five, the Church and the Virgin Mary? Oh, we've got five, five, ten minutes still, yeah? Yeah, sure. All right, well, we're not going to finish because this is a pretty central theme for him. Uh, bottom of that first page of the section, page 81, he's talking about the fact that the council decided to have its statement about the Virgin Mary as part of the doctrine of the church and not separate. And that was originally in the, in the original uh, schemata uh, that were eventually changed. And then there was an attempt to, uh, you know, a proposal to separate church and Mary. And then they decided, no, no, they belong together. So at the bottom of that page is, is in any case, the decision of the council it had been suggested by the Pope to view the role of the Virgin Mary in the context of the church had more than one happy outcome. Not only did it crown the whole constitution brilliantly, and indeed few better means could have been chosen to ensure that chapter seven would have a continuity with patristic thought without any detriment to subsequent progress, but also, and more importantly, it allowed the church herself to be seen as spouse, and Virgin Mother, the patristic theme par excellence. So that's what I kind of mentioned before. Uh, what, he's, he's happy to count. Of course, I mean, he's a modest man, but the fact is he's probably the most important theologian at the council for this document. I mean, this this document, Lumen Gentium, has the Lubach written all over it, really. Onward. Yep. I don't have anything to to say to eighty eight, so I'm eighty nine, so I'm just holding back because I presume. Okay. Well eighty five, new chap new chapter, this is to summarize what we said before. Under this first aspect of the analogy, Mary and Church, Mary is therefore the figure of the church insofar as she is a sanctifying mother. But the church is also the people of God sanctified or on the way to sanctification. So Mary is a model of the church in both respects, sanctifying mother and people of God, the sanctified people. I wanted to point out something on 84. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. I was, I have so many squiggles, I sometimes can't figure out where I am. Um, but there, there's a, um, there's a shout out here to Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, it's being, this particular quote, this is the top of 84, this particular quote is being attributed to, um, uh, Alwa Miller? Yeah, but Mary in the church is not the prototype of the hierarchical power, 
but the model of the spiritual receptivity to the influx of divine grace. This may and must be understood in two ways, or rather involves two different consequences. Both are explicitly treated in this final chapter, and both are solidly founded in patristic thought. To begin with, the virginal motherhood of Mary, the fruit of this spiritual receptivity, is the prototype of the church's virginal motherhood with regard to Christians. In other words, she's the prototype of our receptivity to God, as well as the church as a whole. And uh, this comes up again, where he does, I think, attribute something to Hans von Balsavar, because this was a big theme with him. Um, why did I do this? Page 91. Yeah, the top of 91. Hansers von Balthasar is the one who often throws into relief what he calls the Marian dimension of the church. He is at pains to show the mysterious continuity between Mary's spiritual experiences in the body and the church's maternal experience. And so, again, you know, this very subtle, this is not a prototype for the hierarchical power. It's a, it's a prototype for every Christian and the entire church. This connection with Hansers von Balthasar's thought, which we, we see here and there. It's it's such a rich book, Father, really. I'm so glad that we're reading I it. Comment on, no, I know we now let we now let forward, but uh but basically I do have the on page ninety one here, a, the, a wonderful quote by Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um the bottom of that first paragraph, Mary, the image of the church, is considered at length as the archetype of Christian contemplation. Yes. And then further down, in Mary, the faithful soul, the church, uh, said the perfect yes, that is the origin and substance of all Christian contemplation. So her fiat, if you like, is, is the archetype of which all of our own little fiats or types. Right. Yes, you'll notice here he, he mentioned three books specifically, Heart of the World, which he, when was earliest books in the early 40s, Prayer, which is a magnificent treatise. That, it, it's on prayer, but it's Mary, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Incarnation, all that. Uh, and then Theology of History. Uh, and and uh, also on page 90, there's a, um, I don't know if he's thinking of Jung, Exactly in this statement here, um, uh, when the Second Vatican Council described uh, in their turn giving them a place, blah, blah, um, the doctrine on the church, as much as that on Our Lady, the council by its authority consecrated something that proceeds from the depths of Catholic consciousness, meaning Mary as 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 archetype of, of, of the church. of, of And so... When the church declared the dogma of the assumption in what year was that? 1950. Some, 1950. 1950. Okay. The church declares as a dogma, the assumption, something that already had been believed the by 54. the faithful or whenever the in the fifties. But Carl Jung, the famous psych psychiatrist, psychoanalyst said that the church in her intuitive understanding of reality her revelation has actually brought something up out of human consciousness not just catholic consciousness that the human being is destined for heaven that 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 god has taken up the human into the divine and you know here at that time a lot of people were upset with the church what it's the 20th century and you're defining a marian dogma and one as goofy as a human body, like being a projectile into heaven and space. And I mean, there was so much outroar, uh, uproar from Protestants, from so-called science conscious people. Like what is the church doing in the night, in the 20th century, uh, defining his dogma that Mary was bodily assumed into heaven. And here you had Carl Jung, one of these rare voices outside the church saying, I think this is an act of genius, spiritual genius. <laughs> uh, Joseph, uh, anything you want to say before we conclude? Uh, no, I, 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 I've, uh, I, well, I think we jumped your gun because you, you, you had things that were further back, and we sort of leaped oh, over you. So, no, 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 no. It's just, it's, you had a footnote to what you said earlier. It was on page ninety-one, and then I jumped yes. on that because I had highlighted that page myself, and so we sort yes. of 
left father behind, so to speak, inadvertently. So that's good. Well, let's let's start again next session yes. with page ninety one. Okay. Thank you all for joining us. Hope to see you at the next session. God bless you. If you enjoyed this discussion, please help spread the word about the Forum Book Club by subscribing to the podcast and writing a review. You can sign up for weekly updates at formedbookclub.ignatius.com.